Hello, everybody. This is Greg Scorzo. Uh, as you know, I'm the writer, director, producer, and composer of Love Before COVID, the play that you just heard. So the last interview I just did that you heard was with Daniel Ashman, who played Joe in this play. And today I'm going to be interviewing Sarah Diel, who plays both Janet and Lorraine, and does both quite convincingly as separate voices, which is something that I've always been quite amazed by. I think you've been probably amazed by it as well if you got to the end of the play before you listen to this. Um, so Sarah Diel um, is somebody that I used to work with at a place called PH Jones where we both worked to help people get their boilers fixed between, in my case, it was 10 p.m. and 8 a.m. And I think you did recruitment work so that people like me could do this job effectively. And you actually got me this job. That's the last <laughs> time we worked together before we did this play, right? Yeah, I was the senior account coordinator for British Gas. So I just, I, rec I recruited constantly um, up and down the country for all of their roles, including PH Jones. So yeah, it was, um, it was an interesting ride there. I left there in 2012 and life has been fantastic ever since. <laughs> yeah. So one of the things that was fascinating to me is I've known you probably since 2007. I started working with you there in 2011 yeah. and I stopped working there in 2012. But throughout the next four or five years, I had no idea that you were an actress. I had no idea. Neither so, did I. <laughs> Before you did Love Before COVID with me, had you done a lot of acting before? No, not really on a professional level, but we, I did all the way through uh, childhood. So from two and a half, I did ballet and did the usual stuff. But I was always a little bit gobby for a, a ballerina. So um, I ended up going into um, acting on a very small level with like the local YMCA and, um, and put on a few shows. I'd also do it to... Um, the elderly because my mum worked in residential homes so I was always roped in for Christmas shows and summer shows and so all through my childhood I was doing various uh, acting dancing singing type things because I just had that crazy personality that most parents just want to slap out of kids um, but <laughs> I just had a lot to say and a lot to do so I found that was a very good outlet for me um, and then I hadn't done it for a very long time and I'd done a couple of voiceover bits here and there. And uh, so this one was actually the, the first time that I'd downed all of the tools and just picked up a script and really went for it. So it was an experience for me to do this, which was nice because I hadn't done it for such a long time. Um, and it was so much fun working with Daniel, uh, who plays Joe and you guys. And so, yeah, it was um, it was wonderful. I really enjoyed it. How did you find it? Well, the fact that you say that you were a gobby kid yeah, well. that came in really handy in the characters you played. Yeah, it did. Like Gobby as well. <laughs> yeah, and also working along with um, being brought up in a residential home. Literally, my mum worked there from when I was two and a half years old. Right. So most of my best friends when I was five were like in their eighties. So I dealt with mental health before it was a thing. Uh, before people started recognizing mental health, I literally grew up around that and grew up around people um, that had various different issues and um and just dealt with that and didn't judge them for it or anything else and so i i would be sitting there singing vera lynn you know while everyone and my friends would be singing incidency spider i'd be there going we'll need again so i was always a bit of a quirky kid in that in that respect in that way um but uh what was the question i was going to ask you um was this your first starring role in in voiceover work yes Okay, so that's interesting. So this is sort of the first radio play or pod play where you were not just a star, but you played in a way, maybe both protagonist and antagonist at the same time. No, it, and it's true. And the strange thing is, is I, I have um, qualities of both characters, um, which is probably why it was quite um, straightforward if you like, for me to play it, because I might not be completely uh, Janet or completely Lorraine, but I've certainly met people like that and I've certainly engaged with people like that. Um, and because I'm quite a strong communicator, I don't, I, I don't take any shit either. So I kind of understand uh, both sides of that coin because 
I think when anybody listens to it, you'll, you'll start to think that you're a psychopath. Like when you hear Janet, you think, God, I'm a bit like that. I'm a, that is something that I feel like, do I, do I care if people die that I don't know? Do I like it? And you start questioning going, well, if I don't, well, am, am I a psychopath? But then at the end of it, you think, well, I'd much rather be the psychopath like Janet than I would Lorraine because Lorraine is a broken child as far as I'm concerned. She's broken from a very young age. And this is all, it's just her bravado. I just don't think that she understands her filter is gone and that she says things that are very, very hurtful, but to her it's factual. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't, it, it, she'd rather have true than, than false. And I'm, I'm very much like that in person. Even though I would never dream of saying half the things that Lorraine would, I probably would deliver it in the same way. Mm -hmm. so but without the harshness so I wouldn't say I would never look at somebody who was big for example and say god look at that fat person because the irony is I'm fat myself um but I would never do that but I would if I thought somebody was lying I'd say well why are you lying you know I would be straightforward in that way of communication so that made it quite easy to play Lorraine because I did I, I naturally have that way of communicating anyway but um but yeah I connected to them both quite easily to be fair i don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing <laughs> okay so janet is a psychopath who kind of behaves at least like a nice person and lorraine is not a psychopath who has a much that's harder one. Time, a much harder time behaving like a nice person yeah it's strange because you you know that one has a diagnosis inverted commas and one doesn't and to me that's the only difference because that is Janet may have had the diagnosis, but is completely aware of herself and uses her tools. As most of us who have suffered with mental health in our life, we have a tool bag inside that, you know, the way that we deal with different situations that come towards us and we dig in that bag and we deal with it. And that's kind of what Janet has had to do is she is aware that she doesn't have those feelings, but she's also aware that people need to hear that you do have them. Mm. And so she's very intelligent in the way that She's like, well, no, I understand that's how you feel. I don't feel that way, but I have to go above and beyond my own expectations to meet yours. And so that actually does show a level of care where most people wouldn't care if that's not how they felt. So yes, she's a psychopath, but actually that's just a diagnosis on a paper. I think that we all have a little bit of psycho in us if that's the case, because um, I think we all lie. I think we all have faces. I think we all act. I think, you know, sometimes we show empathy where we don't feel it. And sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, uh, we're over empathetic for things that we wouldn't even dream that we thought we would be like watching a film or whatever. And you suddenly in floods of tears, you don't know them. You don't know those characters, but you empathize with it because you put yourself in that position or you feel sorry for them. So you cry. Whereas some people don't, don't cry at films. Are they psychopaths? because they're not connecting to it you know but mm -hmm. it's it's a it's a bit of a minefield because it depends on I, I think it really depends on the individual so you can look at the blanket diagnosis of a psychopath and anybody who you say that to if you were to say to anybody or oh, you've been diagnosed a psychopath they would just they would raise the eye at least like oh god oh shit am I in trouble am I at risk is this person going to kill me are they going to go psychotic in a second but then if you said to somebody, oh, I have anxiety, suddenly everybody knows what that is. 10 years ago, people didn't know what anxiety was. They thought it was breathing heavily into a paper bag and like having a complete panic attack. They didn't understand that anxiety shows in many different ways. And so if we understand that about anxiety, then we need to start learning about people with that kind of diagnosis aren't going to suddenly just go out with a knife and start killing people. They might have the, the lack of, of empathy to do that, but it doesn't mean that they're going to make that choice. Yeah, the, the term psychopath, that's the one mental health label that yeah. there's no awareness about and there's total stigma towards unreservedly. Yeah, and uh, schizophrenia too. All of those labels that we get given uh, generally in life come with a stigma that we've been taught through media, through schools, through very little uh, mental health education. Unless you go looking for it, the only... Uh, perception you will have of mental health is what you've been told from other people. Um, it's very rare that someone will go, mm, that's an interesting word. Let me just do uh, a, a massive search online for what it means to be a psychopath or what it means to be schizophrenic and then look at all of the different things. People don't do that. They just, they just take their first initial thought of what that looks like and then run with it. And I think this, this, if this will make people question themselves of, 
hang on a minute, if somebody did that action, I would call them X. But now I relate to somebody who's called that through Janet, like most people that I know that have listened to this, um, relate to Janet immediately and go, God, am I, am I a psychopath? And that's brilliant because then you start Googling what that is. You start to, or not Google, duck, duck, go. I don't advocate for them. But anyway, um, so they start searching for information on it and then they'll educate themselves on what that looks like. But I think Joe's reaction to Janet, again, is even, even more explosive because you start to think to yourself, God, I've, I've been in a relationship with somebody for three years and it's been lovely. And the minute somebody else external to that relationship call labels you in a different way, suddenly your relationship status and everything around it has just changed because of a label that somebody else external to your relationship has given you. I suppose when you go for a uh, assessment, you have to tick so many boxes to get that final diagnosis and you have to go through a few hoops and stuff. But generally, if you've been living with somebody for three years, you would you would know their ins and outs, their ups and downs, their tools, their triggers. You would get to know that. And so I think blaming, you know, just stopping a relationship based on the fact that somebody has had a different diagnosis <laughs> was crazy to me. And I think more people will be outraged at the fact that he has dumped a psychopath rather than staying it out with a psychopath. But if you'd have asked them that before they heard it, mm -hmm they would have a completely opposite zip view because most people go, yeah, I would, I would, of course I would dump a psychopath. Why would you want to be in a relationship with a psychopath? But then you think to yourself, well, that particular psychopath was kind and caring and she cared enough to adapt herself and to understand herself and to create tools and to um, put those tools in place so she, she didn't make people feel like they, they didn't matter to her. And those that mattered did. Um, she just didn't really necessarily care about his friends or whatever you know whereas he was he seemed quite needy but he ended up sounding more like the psychopath than she did and so then we have to bring ourselves to what is our perception of a psychopath what is that what does it look like to mm -hmm. us because then we suddenly start connecting either with joe or with janet and then you have to you have all these questions and then when you meet lorraine who is a different kettle of fish altogether because she is just literally she's she has a chastity belt on her personality like there's no one with a key for that it's she is just uptight she just has a regime and I think it shows a lack of um a lack of love and attention as a child um and it's it's very much brought through it's just very factual with her because anything around uh, any kind of empathy or um basically all the tick boxes of what everyone thinks a psychopath is she ticks every box because she it doesn't impact her like it's all about her impacting whereas Janet actually cared enough about others to change and adapt her what she needed mm -hmm. whereas Lorraine absolutely cannot do that and then you think about what she's saying and it's horrible and it's vile but then you think to yourself when you're really really honest with yourself and you've sat and watched the program say you just sat there with your partner and you're, you're at home watching telly you, you do catch yourself being judgy. You do catch yourself saying, God, what are they wearing? What do they look like? You wouldn't say that to their face. Gosh, Lorraine might, but yeah, you know, most people wouldn't. But, you know, the different, what is the difference then? You know, is she honest? Is she honest to a point with no filter? Or is she just rude? Because um, people don't expect people to have an honest opinion about people. And this is where I connect with Lorraine, if, if you can. It's because I'm a very straightforward person. And I, that I don't understand, and maybe it is something that's wired in my brain differently, but I don't understand why people lie to each other. Like, for example, um, as a child, I grew up in the residential home, like I mentioned, and in the staff room, I would hear people going, oh, you know, she's so crap at her job and she won't empty the commodes and she won't do this, that and the other. That person will walk in and everyone goes, oh, hi, love, you're all right, how have you been? You've been all right. And then she'd walk out again and they'd start again. And I'd be like, so confused at the fact that, hang on a minute, as a child this is, hold on, two minutes ago you were just saying that she was annoying, but now you've just been nice to her, she has no idea that you find her annoying, and she's got no way of correcting what you're finding wrong with her, because no one's telling her what she's doing in order to correct it, to stop them from bitching, but you're going to carry on being nice to her and then bitch behind her back. So I just, as a child, never 
had that filter. So I would tell people, I'd go, so why do they think that you're not emptying commodes? Like, I'm not sure, but I think you're a lovely person. But if you just did a few more commodes, then they'd stop talking like this about you. And obviously that wasn't the done thing as a child. <laughs> But my filter wasn't there because I just thought, well, if everyone just spoke about stuff and just actually said what they thought and what they felt, everyone would know where they stand. Either don't speak to that person or speak to that person or I connect to you or I don't connect to you. Or if you're going to do something, say you're going to do it and then do it. Don't just say you're going to do it and then not do it. Like, so I understand that level, but I don't, I think because we understand that our, what we say and what we do can affect other people differently as adults you start to learn not to say stuff and not because you're not not because you're being dishonest but because you care enough about the other person to not want to hurt their feelings but I get to the point of I understand I don't need to say something to hurt your feelings but am I being honest with you Mm -hmm. so and that's an important trait for me and my friends and people around me is for them to be honest with me so you know it's a fine line I just don't I think that she's probably misunderstood and I think that she is angry about a lot of things. And I don't think that even though she goes on about the superficial stuff, you have to feel sorry for her in that respect because she lives in a bubble in her head, a perfection bubble. And, you know, she can't even live up to that herself. So she's constantly battling for this and she constantly doesn't understand why people don't want to be in this bubble because it's so perfect to her in her head. But it's almost like a fantasy land. It's like a child creating a... Um, Imaginary friend? Imaginary friends. I don't know why I couldn't think of that word. Thank you. It's like a child with an imaginary friend. Um, And they know they're not real, but that's their existence. But to them, they are real. They want mum to, you know, make a place for them at tea time. They want to have a chat to them. And it's almost like that. She has this, this one bubble. And if she's taken out of that bubble, she just can't function. She doesn't understand. And so, again, that is a different type of mental health. And through that, she is vile to joe and it's not you know you can't condone what she's saying because it's it's abuse almost but she doesn't see it as abuse she sees it as she's trying to help you because she's being honest with you Mm -hmm. and so it's so quick to sit there and go i hate lorraine she's just this horrible vile person but why is she a vile person why is she like that what has she seen what has she heard how does she feel Mm -hmm. and joe actually once you've heard what he said to janet you kind of you want him to get a bit of comeuppance don't you you want him to be accountable for what he's done and what he said and actually it's almost like divine retribution so he's gone through that period of time with Janet and he could have continued to have a lovely relationship with Janet but he chose not to because he thought he was taking some sort of moral upper ground and then he's put himself in a position with somebody else who's who's now treating him almost the same with the same contempt as what he treated Janet and so you kind of even though you feel sorry for Joe in the second half you kind of go well this is a learning curve for you. <laughs> you need to learn from this. You need to learn how you speak to people. You need to learn how you, how you, um, how you judge a situation. And um, I think from Lorraine's point of view, she has to learn that she needs to step outside of her bubble. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's very interesting. I think, there's, I think there's probably another show after that. Okay. Um, I think there's another probably sh- another show. What do you mean exactly? <laughs> I think there's... I think, um, well, like anything, it's a journey, isn't it? And you can see all the journeys and the journey goes so far. But then you want to know what happens. You want to know, does she learn? Does she learn a lesson? Oh, that's in the book. That's in the book, Love Post-Socratic Dialogues, coming out February 14th, 2021. What a beautiful day. That's my daddy's birthday. Yeah. Valentine's Day. Fabulous. So one of the things I wanted to ask you was, you were saying it it was nice to hear Joe get some comeuppance. But do you think in the 13 years that had passed since he dumped Janet that he'd become a different person? Or do you think he was still sort of the same? I think he certainly hadn't learned anything in those 13 years. I think once you've, you've gone through something like that and then you've ended up in, in a similar situation, but the other side of the coin, I don't think he's learned anything from it. I think he just carries on. I think he just likes to sit in his moral high ground and likes to comment on the world and comment on things but doesn't actually do anything about it like he has no backbone he doesn't leave uh Lorraine do you know what I mean he doesn't he does he puts up with it constantly and it's almost like it's his torture it's like self uh pain it's like um self-harm in a way yeah. yeah so instead of doing physical harm to himself he's putting him through himself putting him through that relationship with Lorraine 
as some sort of self-harm. So it's like, he doesn't feel now that he deserves somebody because he's got an eye patch and he's, he's put on weight and he knows that he, he buggered up with Janet. He probably knows that he's, he took that too far and mm. he regrets it because Janet went on to have a fabulous life and she was very successful. And so he, it, I, think it's a, I think Lorraine, in a way, is a bit of self-harm for Joe, which is never going to work out well because Lorraine is an oblivious. Lorraine, Lorraine is oblivious to anything outside of her bubble mm. and he, he just perpetuates that so do you think he's doing this he's taking on all this punishment to feel sort of morally superior or do you think he's doing it because he feels guilty about janet both i think the same as we change personalities to you know to whoever we're talking to at the time we all do we're all chameleons in that way um i think it's the same thing i think he licks his wounds and then he creates another wound and then he licks his wounds and then he creates another wound and you know i think it's um it's a perpetual cycle that he's in and I don't think he knows how to get out of it. And I think he thinks that he isn't attractive enough or um, nice enough to find another person. Um, So I think it's just a perpetual cycle of feeling self regret about Janet, about feeling self-conscious about himself and his looks um, about punishing himself because he knows he's, he's, he thinks he's punching above his weight because apparently Lorraine is this beautiful slim lady who you know is giving him all this attention but why why is she with him like what (laughs) what is her purpose in this if she doesn't like big people and she doesn't like um unattractive people what is she doing with joe what does she get from that well she says it's the um, attention isn't it she says nobody else will stay with me yeah because she's she's honest and she's direct and she's vile and says things that people don't want to hear on a daily basis but do we need it do we need to hear that or do we not need to hear that? Yeah. Well, that's interesting that you should raise that question because in the play, um, she does say that uh, big people need to hear that they're disgusting to lose weight. And Joe says they don't need to hear that. And then she says, of course they do. And she lists all these reasons like, you know, uh, the National Health Service, depleting the resources of the planet, forcing other people to lie to them. She really thinks that being big is like a, a morally bad thing, like yeah. almost like a politically reactionary thing. And, and you know what? The thing is, I don't agree with her statement because obviously I'm a, I'm a big girl, big and fabulous and harder to kidnap. But in t- I don't agree with her um, topics, if you like, mm-hmm. but I don't disagree with how she delivers it sometimes in terms of how she delivers it but i don't agree on the topics that she delivers does that make sense yeah so i think if we're all a little bit more upfront about what we feel is morally right or wrong it's i think it would just be easier and better but she has just picked a group of people because it makes her feel better so it's not necessarily like she has a point because she doesn't take into consideration medical reasons or mental health reasons she doesn't Mm -hmm. take into consideration um how people cope with life or you know people that generally just can't help being a bit big boned like my good self you know her argument is you know you need to stop being lazy and get up and do that and you know what for a portion of society that's true some Mm -hmm. people are lazy i'm lazy i am big because i don't exercise i eat too much or i eat the wrong thing should i say at the wrong time and that's why i'm fat and i can admit that but I can guarantee you there's not many fat people out there that will agree with that. And mm-hmm. so it is, it's, it's a fine line. It's a fine line because it, it, then once she's, once she's picked a demographic to pick on, then that's what she's, that's all she's doing. But to her, it doesn't mean anything because it doesn't impact her. If they were talking about uh, beauty or, um, you know, something she was passionate about, like the gym or whatever it was, and you started listing off the reasons why you shouldn't do that. Mm-hmm. Um, then she would probably get quite annoyed by that. And then you would put her, you need to go back to her and talk her language back to her. And then she would probably understand how to be more empathetic. Mm -hmm. But I think because people don't give her the time to, um, what's the word I'm looking for now? To take it in, in a way that she understands. So like, she doesn't understand fat people. She doesn't understand kind people. She doesn't understand loving families. She doesn't understand a lot of these things in life that we're all used to. Mm -hmm. So you need to talk her language. It's a bit like the love languages in relationships. Everybody communicates on different levels. So 
if you were to, if I was to have a conversation with Lorraine, for example, I would just use an example using her life so that she would understand what it means to say something negative about something that she likes and how she would feel about that. Well, interestingly, um, there is one part where Joe does say something that really hurts her, which is when you were drunk, you were violent. Yeah. That really but I think, hurts. but then that again is admitting that she's not perfect. So yeah. she doesn't want to know about that. She doesn't want to see it. It's like the bogeyman under the bed. It's, it's not something she wants. She thinks she's dealt with that. She has said she's accepted that. But what she's not realized is that inside her head, she hasn't dealt with that at all whatsoever remotely. But outwardly, because she says it, she thinks it. And so by him bringing that up, she was offended by that, completely offended. It's almost like, no, I've put that to bed. Who are you to bring that up? But yet she's okay to do it to everybody else because she doesn't understand that feeling. So yes, she was brought up on the alcoholism side of things, but you need to go deeper than that even because you need to get her to understand how it feels for every part of her life to be questioned because mm -hmm. that's what she does to others she doesn't just pick up one thing she picks up lots of different things and there's always a reason she's got an answer for everything mm -hmm. and so if the only thing if if she when joe goes back to her and talks about her alcoholism she becomes very angry very quickly because again, that's a form of defense. If she gets louder and angrier and stands in his face, it's more likely that he's going to shut up and sit down and do what she wants him to. She's mm -hmm. learned all the tools to, to get people to come around to her way of thinking very quickly. And she thinks it's by bullying people or talking louder or you know doing that kind of stuff. She thinks that's her way in. But when, if she was to be challenged, um, by somebody who was completely calm and just let her bounce off the walls, but then eventually come and sit down. I think there'd be a breakthrough with her. Mm -hmm. I, I have to have that hope <laughs> so that everybody, because otherwise it's a bit of a witch hunt, isn't it, for Lorraine? Because she is the she is the bad guy of this whole thing. But I think it's all about perception, genuinely. Mm -hmm. What do you think of her relationship to her own beauty? Do you think that's healthy, or do you think she's got a very unhealthy relationship to being beautiful? No, I don't think she believes a word of it. Really? I, I, think that she, I don't think she believes a word of it. I think that she's told that she is. So she says the words. And so when she says it, it is it in her head. But I don't think she believes it for one second. I think that she panics. I think she would be the type of person to panic if she got a spot or panic if her hair didn't go right or, you know, if she looked slightly different to what she used to when everyone was telling her she was beautiful. I think she would panic. I don't think she genuinely believes that she is in herself because that's why she's so vile because she has to work so hard at it. Not because she goes to the gym every day, but she has to work hard at convincing herself in her head that she is beautiful. Because mm -hmm. inside, I don't think she is. I think in, I think in her perception, there is a portrait of Doreen Gray in her loft and <laughs> that she is literally fine on the outside, but she knows somewhere her soul is getting eaten up by something. She doesn't feel pretty and she doesn't feel like that person. She probably feels like a fat person, which is probably why she guns for them because that's the portrait she doesn't want anyone to see. That's, that's her inside who she doesn't want to see. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of body dysmorphia about her, I think. Mm -hmm. And with that, you can have people that have uh, eating disorders all the time that are, you know, they don't weigh a lot at all. And you can tell that they're not big, but in their heads, there is a distortion and uh, the body dysmorphia where they look at themselves and they can see fat coming out of places where it just isn't. Mm -hmm. I think she's very much on those lines. Okay. So that's really interesting because one of the things that she does say to Joe at one point is she does say to him, um, I need you to lose weight because you being fat makes me feel fat and mm. I feel ugly and I can't handle that. Yeah. But, uh, I, and, that, and that's true to her. That's, she genuinely feels like that, but then she wants to change Joe. She suddenly wants to make him into something that he isn't. And she genuinely thinks that she can do that by bullying him. Like she, she has, she has that complete confidence that if she just bullies him and just tells him the truth that he will suddenly go to the gym, lose weight, and then he's going to be this perfect boyfriend. Like that, that's how distorted her world is. That's how her perfect bubble is. And it's never going to happen. Of course, it's never going to happen. But then we assume that because 
Janet has a diagnosis and Joe has been through this trauma that, you know, everybody is okay. And it's not just because Lorraine hasn't been uh, diagnosed in this particular story does not mean that she doesn't have issues. And I think it's the unspoken issues that is most interesting about it. Because with Janet, the story is out there straight away from the beginning. You know what she is. You can then have two sides of the coin. So you've got a diagnosis. You've got her views on things. You can see, see it. Well, you can hear how she responds to things in quite a calm, measured way. Um, how she was genuinely upset when Joe was telling her stuff. You know, like she was responding as a human being, how we would expect a human being to respond. But she, yet she has a diagnosis and yet Lorraine's responds in the complete opposite way to how most of us would. But then we feel all right about that. We, we feel all right about calling her a bitch because she hasn't got a diagnosis. But right. would we feel okay about calling her a bitch if we knew that she had severe PTSD, for example, or Borderline that she had body dysmorphia? or borderline personality disorder, which is exactly along the lines of what she is. Um, I, do I think she's all bad? No, I don't. I think nobody on the earth is all bad, but you know, she has so much armor. She literally has a chastity belt on her personality and she doesn't even know what that looks like. She doesn't mm -hmm. even know what her own personality is. And I think she um, panics when she meets people that do, that know themselves and that are comfortable in themselves. It's just something that she's never been. So this is why she has a problem with fat people is because some of some big people like myself, we're quite comfortable in, in our bodies and we're okay and we can go out and feel okay. She doesn't, she has to be pristine. She has to keep up with this beautiful regime. She has to keep every hair in place, every lipstick in place. She has to keep all this regime. Otherwise she is not beautiful in her head. And so that tells you that it's not, <laughs> you know, it's not an average personality for her to have. So yeah. but everybody feels like when they listen to it, they're like, oh God, she's, she's a bitch. And you know, they're, they're almost to tears listening to it because she's vile about it. But sometimes the words come out, but it's actually anger that she's expressing or fear or disappointment. But she knows how to articulate herself in a way that it's gonna make the other person feel sad or angry because that's how she feels in herself. And she's learned how to articulate herself to bring that person down to her level, if you like, of yeah. how she feels about herself, as opposed to Janet, who would potentially go above and beyond to try and bring you up um, and to make you feel good about yourself, you know? Mm -hmm. So what would you do if you were meeting, let's say, Lorraine in, in real life and she started attacking you the way that she attacks Joe because of your weight? How would you react? I'd probably hug her. That would freak her out. I would go up and I would hug her. <laughs> <laughs> and say it's all right baby it's all right you can just be yourself um and then i'd probably get a high <laughs> <laughs> it's the only way i'd probably do that i'd probably just get a high and then have a little chat because she's obviously got a drinking problem so i definitely don't want to get her drunk mm -hmm. um and i'd want to chill out and i'd probably make a share of cheesecake with me <laughs> okay have you met people like her before in real life? Yeah, in business. They're, they're in offices, left, right and centre, all over the country. Mm -hmm. There is always a Lorraine in every office who talks about every diet going, who's been on every diet going. You know, it's always pristine and always has something to say about others in the office. And, you know, we call them Karens, but I don't want to like, because I'm sure not all Karens are terrible and I don't want to use her Karen's name because I do know a lot of lovely Karens, but... Sadly, Lorraine, seems like a much worse, Lorraine seems like a much worse stereotype than a Karen. <laughs> I know it's true, but, um, but no, yeah, they're everywhere. We've got, we've got people like that everywhere because unfortunately our society shows us a picture of beauty or what they deem beauty is. And they show us what it should look like uh, and media and television and um, reality TV and things like that. They all give us a false impression of what life looks like. Um, mm. And then these people who are conditioned from birth, you know, we're given a birth certificate, we're given a name, we're told when to get up, when to go to bed, what to eat, what to sleep, what to drink. You know, everything is, is conditioned throughout our whole life that um, by the time we all go to work, it's, it's exactly the same. So we're like, oh God, right, I'm working in this office. I need to be like that person or I need to be like that person or I need to be like that person. Um, and then you've got a whole, you've got half of the office, which is anxious <laughs> women who can't live up to the mark and have holes in the tights and might not get sushi for lunch. They might just want a sandwich from Greg's, you know. So it's women, like, women feel like Joe. 
yeah well precisely like but they're told that they're not good enough and so the Lorraines in all the offices are telling them that they're not good enough and they're normally like manager level so they can sit down and go you know and pass some sort of judgment but yeah there's a load of Lorraines out there and I think when people listen to this they will know if they are one or not Mm -hmm. that's really interesting so tell us a bit how you came up with the two different voices for Janet and Lorraine Mm, well, Janet was easy because obviously I'm a Leicester girl myself and uh, she was based in Leicester. Mm-hmm. So that was, uh, that was a fairly easy transition. I suppose Janet is my um, drunk voice <laughs> because uh, you end up, when you, when, you, when you have a drink or something, you end up going really uh, raw back to your roots, don't you? Like my mum is a Geordie and she doesn't drink anymore. But like when she used to have a little brandy, um, she'd talk like that all the time. She'd like have a lovely Geordie accent. Mm-hmm. And yet now she lives in Ireland. She's got like half a, an Irish twang. But I think, um, yeah, I found Janet just by um, digging deep into my Leicester roots. And then Lorraine um, was a little bit outside my comfort zone because I'm not that, per- as in I'm not that person because even though I am very honest and I do uh, require and request and uh, respect truth back to me um I'm certainly not on her level so I had to kind of give her what I would expect somebody like that to sound like and it would be if if I was Lorraine um she's trying to be perfect so in everything that she does she's trying to be perfect so that also means over pronunciation of words like she likes to do because she needs to sound posh and so that is that's where Lorraine came from it's just the fact that the rest of her personality was all perfection and so that's why it was good to do the posh voice but a little tiny snippet of my accent would come through at times which told you that she's not quite as posh as she thinks she is well it's funny because when we were recording that there would be moments when I'd listen to the take and I'd say oh no it's it's Lester again but then I would think, no, wait a minute. Like, she's putting on an accent. So the yeah. real accent probably is closer to Janet anyway. Because yes. from Darby. That's right. And it's, 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 her, it's just her way of kind of distancing herself from everything that she was. Because she wants to create a new bubble. She mm-hmm. wants <laughs> not a COVID bubble, just a normal bubble. Right. Um, but she, she wanted to create this perfect bubble of existence and everybody needed to meet that expectation, including herself. And so her voice kind of, that came quite naturally when you think about what someone would do when they're trying to put on, that like we all do, it, I suppose, when we answer the phone. I mean, not so much you because you're from LA, you've got slightly different, you're more laid back than all of us actually. But, you know, Lizzie will tell you and most people, most people will tell you that when they answer the phone, they're like, hello, how are you? You know, we all have a phone voice. So mm-hmm. she is, she was born out of a, a very posh phone voice. And that, that's who she tries to portray all the time. Yeah. And it must be tiring for her. Like she must be knackered. Yeah, because every once in a while it slips. Yeah. And she doesn't like that and that yeah, and makes her angry. And so then more vileness will spill out, especially exactly. if she makes the mistake. My favorite slip of hers is when she says, I'm fucking disgusted of you. <laughs> that was the most Irish I've ever heard you sound. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Southern Irish coming out in you right there, Greg. I know, I know. No, that's a bad <laughs> imitation of a Midlands accent. Because, you know, I've yeah, but I loved it. it. Keep trying. Go on, do it yeah. again. Well, no, I've lived in England for 15 years and I can write English characters. I cannot do English accents of any kind to save myself. Well, if it's any consolation, I can't do American either. I'm really bad. As you know, we've tried. It you just... can do Southern American. You just can't do my accent. But not very long. Not very long. I don't. All I can say is KFC. That's about as far <laughs> as you're going to get. And as long as I can order that, I'll be fine. But no, I'm terrible with American accents. I could probably do most regional mm-hmm. accents in the UK, but definitely America, I'm going to have to work out. Yeah. Well, if you do, let me know. I have some American characters you can play in the next one I do. <laughs> As long what could they be like Anglo American? Because I reckon that would work. <laughs> Maybe. We'll see. We'll half see. Irish, half American. We'll we'll get there. So um when we get to the end of the play and you see Joe and Lorraine are making up and Joe's apologizing to Lorraine and saying, I need to lose weight and I need to hear what you say without taking it personally and so on. Did that yeah, sound like a happy ending? In my mouth. 
Did that make you uh, think this is a happy ending? No, it made me sick in my mouth because I want him to stand up and go, you're a twat, I'm leaving. And then the door closed because that's what I feel I should be doing if I was him. Mm -hmm. I'd be like, what, what? No. In fact, I have stopped toxic relationships in the past and there's nothing better than walking away from them kind of stuff. But the fact that he, he felt like he needed to change and he needed to put up with all that still, I kind of just thought, well, you've made your bed, Joe, you're an idiot. So crack on. But I was really sad about it because I think Joe could be an absolutely lovely partner to the right person but he is so needy in himself as well mm -hmm. that I just I think everyone needs therapy <laughs> they they all need a night out somewhere and they just all need to go and get drunk together and just like sit in the toilets and have a chat about it that's how we used to do things in the 90s mm -hmm. was we go out we get drunk and talk in a toilet and then everything the world was right again and that's how I feel like Joe and Janet and Lorraine need to go and they just need to talk it out and get over it because I think none of, in, the only person that come out well of this is Janet funnily enough because she went on to be very successful mm -hmm. and she was a writer and she, she you know she had quite a good life after, after him whereas he just perpetuates it it's just it's almost like he likes the self-harm so he just carries on and just carries on and he's like yeah you're right I'll just I'll look at myself. It's like, he doesn't know who he is any more than Lorraine knows who she is. Mm -hmm. They're both playing parts of who they think people are. His is very moralistic. He's like, no, that's not right. You've got to be kind to people. You've got to do all this fine. But he can't be kind to himself. Like, he has no idea how to be kind to himself. So how the hell does he know how to tell other people to be kind to people when he, he can't even recognise his own needs? And Lorraine doesn't even know what other people's needs are. Like she doesn't, she's just oblivious to whatever that is because she's trying too hard every minute of the day to live up to this standard that she has inside her head. So the most well-rounded person out of this whole thing is Janet, who was the psychopath. Who was the psychopath. So do you know what, it, what I, I got from it was that I'd much rather know 15 Janets than one Lorraine or one Joe. That's interesting. So when Lorraine is talking to Joe and saying, um, I love you, even though I think you're, you know, um, an, an idiot and you're a failure and you're fat and you have a small penis and this and that, but I love you anyway. That's unconditional love. Yeah. I'd ask her to define what her love is. I'd ask her to define what that is because what is that then? So you don't think I that think is love? I, I don't, I don't I know. I do not. I don't think you would say to someone you love, I love you, even though you're a knobhead, which is basically what she's saying. I'd say, I care for you, but I wouldn't say I love you. And I don't even think she could go as far as saying that she cares for them. Interesting. She so you think if you love herself. someone, yeah, if you love someone, you wouldn't insult them and say, but I love you anyway. Yeah. Like, look, there are, there's levels to this, right? So like, for example, if you've been in a relationship and then you know, that every single time your partner doesn't put the, the toilet seat down, right? Mm -hmm. You can go, I think you're a bloody twat for doing that, but I still like you, right? Because you can get over the fact that it's just the toilet. It's just the toilet. You can lift it up or put it down. It doesn't impact your relationship. But mm -hmm. when it comes to personal insults about your physical appearance, you expect the one person that's going to give you compliment is, is your partner, not to bring you down. Now, I'm not saying like if you were to about to walk out and you had mayonnaise on your face or you had something there and you, you know, a spot or whatever. And you, your partner went, Oh, let me just get that for you before you go out. That's kind. That's, that's okay. I can deal with that. But if they're going to go, God, your face looks shit today. Why are you even going out? Who does that? Lorraine. It's the person who's hurting. Exactly. Lorraine, she's hurting. She's thinking it herself about herself. So she has to project that because that's the only way she can control it without wanting to kill herself. I think because she just does not like herself. And I think, she knows that and so she has to project what she thinks that she should be like on other people do you think joe wants to kill himself no i think he's too obsessed with his anxiety no i think he finds comfort in as as you know what people who suffer with anxiety will tell you this me included is that although we hate the feeling of anxiety it's familiar so we can sit in it and we know what we need in it. So we know we need a dark room or we know we need a candle or we know we need some music or we need to read a book or we know, you know, we know we need to kind of subdue ourselves and we kind of feel comfortable in that moment. When we get what we need in that anxiety moment, we feel comfort. And so it is a, um, it's a very 
familiar place to be. And I think Joe has got so familiar with that place. He doesn't know how to, how to be happy. Like that is his happy place, even though it's absolutely not a happy place mm -hmm. to him. That's all he knows. So it's like, right, well, what am I doing wrong then? It must be me. And, you know, instead of actually going, do you know what? I just need to quit all this shit around all these people. I need to go on a night out. I need to see my friends and go to my, my friend's poetry readings, enjoy it and not have a partner. Fine. But he doesn't know himself well enough. He doesn't know how to create happiness for himself. All he knows is to deal with sadness. The last time he was happy was with Janet. And then he buggered that up. So then since then, he's just self-harmed almost, you know, as in, in internally. He's just internally self-harmed himself. And I don't, I, don't, I don't think he knows a way out of that. And I don't think he wants a way out of that. Interesting. So why do you think Lorraine hates his friend Claire so much, who she says is twice as big as he is? Because she's, cause she's happy. She's big, but she's happy. And she cannot get to grips with that. She cannot work that out. She can't work out why Claire's happy any more than a person in a wheelchair would be happy in theirs. She could not work that out. Now, we know that people find happiness in all sorts of things. Like, you don't, you don't need to be fully functioning to, to have a happy life and to have a very full life. But to her, because hers is so condensed and so compressed about what her needs are and that she needs to be this perfect view, when she sees anybody outside of that perfecting, perfection, perfection view, um, she just can't understand it and thinks that they are crazy or mad or lazy or um almost like a virus <laughs> like to her it's someone she doesn't want to be near it might be catching i don't want to be okay with this and so she turns the other way and in order to turn the other way she has to attack it um and it's almost like a scorpion you know like she's with her tail um <laughs> and it's like she can't understand why claire would be happy and a kind person and um she doesn't understand why joe wants to be friends with somebody like that because she doesn't look perfect like she does like why would you want to talk to all these people that don't look like me and it's like it's, to it's just totally um like a different language to her and in fact that's probably the best analogy I can give you is like everybody else speaks a different language to Lorraine Lorraine has her own language and, and if you think about that that's quite a confusing place to be um you know is in a world that everybody else speaks a different language to you and everyone treats you with contempt but yet you're speaking your own truth you know Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a fine line with her but yeah I think it's mainly because she can see Claire is okay with okay you know with herself her size and her life and she just cannot understand she just cannot comprehend how that comes about because she just cannot even be happy if her hair's out of place mm -hmm. so how the hell do you deal with being a size 20 do you know what I mean it's like she just yeah. just doesn't get it around her head but one thing Lorraine says a lot repeatedly is honesty is how I show my love yeah, and I genuinely think that's right. I think that's what she genuinely believes. And also part of that is I feel that too. As in, mm -hmm. I connect to that part of that. Because I, I do think that you need to be honest to people that you love. But I think there's a way of doing it and saying it and showing it. Whereas she just doesn't have that filter. So mm -hmm. the concept is the same. The concept I agree with. Being truthful to somebody is, is a way of showing love but you can put that in a way that doesn't hurt the other person because she has no concept of that, of how she hurts somebody else. She thinks they're going to receive it the way that she receives it, but she only receives it when it's the true things that she's okay with. The minute you bring up her alcoholism, she's not okay with truth anymore. It's not love anymore. It's hate. It's horrendous. It's attack. It's, you know, so mm -hmm. it, it's only her perception. So again, putting anything that she says into context, you have to then come back to the perfect bubble that she lives in. That's interesting. So one thing that Joe initially got quite upset with her about is she said she wanted to have sex with him, but she said it in a way where it was like, I want to have sex with you, but it's not because I fancy you. It's because I, I think you deserve some sex. And he was quite hurt by this. Do you think she should have said, I want to have sex with you because I fancy you? No, because she was lying. If she did, I think that she just shouldn't have asked for sex in the first place use a dildo like the rest of us fuck's sake just don't expect somebody else to have to serve you but that's what she expects she expects to be served and she also thinks that because she's so beautiful 
that her fanny is the only fanny in the world that's worth having. And so therefore it's a gift to him. She probably is very disconnected from sex or passion or feelings or emotion to do with sex. She's very disconnected from it. Whereas Joe is not disconnected from it and he needs that emotional side to it. But if he'd wor not worked that out after all that time, I don't even know what to say. Because he, you know, how can you be in a relationship with someone that long and not realize they don't fancy you? Well, this is the first time she's actually said it. Mm, well, true. Yeah, I know. But as adults, when you're having sex with your partner, it's, it's a communication, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So you kind of know if someone's into you or not into you. Yeah. And if they're just it. flicking their hair and turning it over, it's not, it's, you know, you know, they're not that into you. Whereas he, this is part of his self. It, I don't think it was news to Joe. I think he knew that the whole way. It was just, it just, I don't think in a million years he thought he was going to hear it, but I think he knew it. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it was as big a shock that, as it was for us as listeners. I mm -hmm. don't think for the character, I don't think it was a big shock. I think he felt that about himself anyway. Mm -hmm. And also during that fight, she does say that she's going to have sex with her friend Sasha and then send it to his students and ruin his career. Do you think she's serious about that? Do you know what? Potentially. Only because she doesn't have consequence. So she doesn't understand about consequence. She says these things mm -hmm. and, she's, and then she'll forget about them in a second. Like she, she'll just say things to, to get a response or a reaction at that second. So if you've made her angry, she's going to say something twice as angry back at you, but not necessarily follow through with it. But she is stubborn enough to do that if he showed enough fear so if joe was like oh no please don't do that don't do that and she thought that would help get what she wanted mm -hmm. she probably would follow through with that without much thought just because she knows how impactful that would be to him mm -hmm. and and that's her level of power that's her her kick if you like that's where she gets her buzz um because it's part of control but mm -hmm. i don't think if he didn't respond to it i don't think she would then follow it through I think she would only follow it through if she felt like the response or the, the reaction would be what she wanted. I don't think she would give a shit about the students and I don't think she would care about how that would impact his job or any of that. I don't think she would care about that. I think she's more bothered about his response to that. So do you think she sort of says these really dramatic, hurtful, frightening things to people just to get control? Yes, and to scare them away so they don't ask questions. Because people who, who fear people like that don't ask questions. They're not going to go, no, but how do you really feel, Lorraine? Like, <laughs> they're not going to do that. They're going to be like, she should call me fat. And then they go into their own ego bubble. And so this is what she knows happens is because she's always in an ego bubble. She's fine with that. And she knows how to respond to that. But that's why she puts people back into that. Because normally when you, somebody says something like that, your immediate response is defense, isn't it? So you'd be like, no, who, what, are you, what are you talking about? Who are you speaking to? So you start getting angry with her. And so she's used to that. That's, that's bread and butter for her. That's how she knows how to articulate yourself in an argument. She knows how to come back at you in that respect. What she wouldn't know how to do is talk about her feelings or to speak about how she actually felt about something because I don't think she knows. So that is her, again, like the scorpion tail. She just uses that to, as her force of defense. So mm -hmm. no, I don't, I think, some of it is about control, but only in the, in the extent of she can control that situation there and then. Not to necessarily take control of that person, but to take control of the situation so that it's not going to impact her emotionally. But mm. I don't think it's like an ongoing thing where she's like, oh, I've got one over on that person. I think she just thinks that she's had a, a, her own win so that that person didn't ask her anything difficult. Mm. So what's interesting is when he finally does say, I want to break up with you because I don't feel loved by you. I feel nothing but contempt. It mm. seems like she starts to panic a bit and mm. wants to try and get back with him. She even says things like, you can fuck my ass tomorrow. I'll get you. <laughs> we can sort this out. And she suddenly becomes really nice for a few minutes. Standard. <laughs> don't we all do that? No, I'm joking. But no, why do you think yeah. she does that? Why is she so committed to this relationship? It's just, do you know what? It's just the same, it's exactly the same uh, manipulation as the angry stuff. The words, the context, the content of her words are meaningless. So forget everything that she's saying. It's how she's saying it. So she will say things that she wants the other person to think, 
there's a response. So whether it's to make them angry, make them sad, make them jealous, make them whatever that is, that's what she's aiming for. So she'll just say the most random shit to, to get a response from that person. She thinks that's what he wants. She thinks she might have read that in a book somewhere that um, she might have watched Fifty Shades of Grey or something and thought, oh, that's what men want. So mm. therefore, because I'm beautiful, then I am the gold. I am the prize. I am the end of the rainbow pot of gold for somebody because I fit into that category. Like this is her perfect bubble, remember? Mm -hmm. So she's offering these things to him, thinking like little carrots on a stick, thinking, well, this will keep him, this will keep him. Because she has no idea how to be emotional about stuff and neither does Joe. And Joe doesn't know how to respond to that. So um, I suppose she's worked him out for long enough to know what kind of carrots he, she, he wants dangled. But the problem is, is that she'd, she'd come clean about how she felt and said it out loud, even though he probably felt it and knew that's how she felt. She mm -hmm. said it out loud for the first time. So she wasn't sure what the response was going to be. Whereas every other time she probably knew what the response was going to be. Whereas mm -hmm. this time she didn't. So there was slight panic there. So it's like, shit, what can I offer him? Like, hang on, I've got 50 pounds in my back pocket. What else have I got? I've got a pair of socks, you know, it's just, yeah. it was all random stuff that she was offering. It's like, it was, it was sheer panic, but I think it was only purely because um, she'd have to change her life. She'd have to change things. She probably wanted to stop what was happening because she needed to get to bed or she wanted to eat something. She probably just wanted to stop that situation. So she just created a solution. And because she hadn't thought it through and she wasn't emotionally connected, that solution was ne never going to work. So she was panicking. But I think basically all those crazy suggestions were part of a solution to stop the conversation. So why do you think somebody like her wants to be with Joe? Why would she sort of fight him so hard and say such mean things to him, but then at the other end of the spectrum, simultaneously panic if he says, okay, let's leave, let's split. Mm. Because why do people have punch bags in their garage? That, you know, it's like she can use him in as like a, a, a human punch bag. And sometimes that human punch bag listens to her and, you know, humors her. And humours her, like he doesn't ever question why she is how she is. And so she likes that because she's created this little perfect bubble. She thinks he believes every single peck of it. And he um, pacifies her. She, he pacifies this pretend thing. It's like when you're a two-year-old and you have a friend come around and you play dolls together. And it's like, you know, the doll's not real, but your other mate, they're playing dolls too. And so that's great. So you have this little pretend thing going on. And it's a bit like that, but as adults. And so I think between the, her and Joe, they... Uh, have created this pretend version of things and because he's her playmate she doesn't know if she'll find another playmate who will accept all her shit and she knows deep down on a deeper level that she, she's gonna have to come clean at some point she's gonna have to open up at some point and she's got to be a person but right now she doesn't need to do that but he is her punch bag and also her little playmate so it's not for anything to do with joe it's nothing to do with her loving him or, or thinking about his situation because deep down she knows he's better off without her Mm. And it was panic, I think. That's interesting. So the ass fucking didn't get him back. But what got him no. back was when she said, I love you unconditionally. I love you despite all these things I hate about you. Mm. And he was moved by that. He was touched by that. Because if you remember what he'd said to Janet was that Janet said all these things. But he was like, but you didn't. You didn't because you've had this diagnosis as a psychopath. So you didn't mean any of that. Mm -hmm. And it was clear from the get go that that was important that he needed to be with someone who had the capacity to mean those things. So whether that's because he, he needs that on an emotional level or he's not able to do that on an emotional level um, and he recognises that and is a bit scared and that's why he ran from Janet is because actually he probably felt like the psychopath more than what she was. But um, I think it became clear at the beginning of the whole thing that um he needed someone to be genuine and whether he did he didn't care what genuine looked like whether it was you know someone like Lorraine telling him all these horrible truths about how she feels but for, in his head she's not a psychopath so therefore she means it out of love mm -hmm. um and that's that's his brain that's that's worked that out and I don't you know again he's undiagnosed in this particular story but that doesn't mean he's without issues and I think it's all part of his his psyche where he needs to hear uh, that somebody's being genuine even if that being genuine hurts his feelings he needs to know it's come from a genuine place whereas he didn't feel that it was genuine with Janet because of 
this diagnosis, which makes no sense to most people who, li who listen to it. Mm -hmm. So I, I just think that because Lorraine is now saying that, and she's mm -hmm. saying it in a way that speaks his language. Don't forget, she's had a long time to manipulate him. She knows how to press his buttons. Mm -hmm. So she knows what to say and how to say it in order to get that response. And she tried the panic um, mm -hmm. and the panic and the butt love, and that didn't work. And so now she's trying the last bit. But what would be interesting is if he didn't fall for that either. I'd like to know what she would have done yeah. uh, as a third option, because that was the last option. And it's something she's not good at because it meant being soft for a minute. It meant being kind. It meant, it meant saying something that's supposed to come from the heart. And she's supposed to say it in some, with some sort of sincerity for him to do it, which doesn't come naturally to her. So actually she had to try very hard to sound sincere so that he would fall for it. And then when he did, that was it. She was happy with that. And then all done, I'm, I'm, I'm moving on to my next task. Because she only wanted to shut the conversation down. She always does. She only ever wants to shut the conversation down once she's finished. That's it. She's not interested in, in anything else. Mm -hmm. What's interesting also is she said that she would stay with him regardless of whether or not he stayed big, as long as she could accept that he accepted the truth. Uh, look at me and say, I'm disgusting. My face is disgusting. My boobs are disgusting. My gut is disgusting. I should have never embarrassed you by making myself so ugly. Thank you for caring for me, Lorraine. Thank you for loving me. And then he couldn't say any of that, but she still took him back anyway. Yeah, because she just needs him as a punch bag. She doesn't mean any of it. Like, she doesn't care if he's big or not. I don't think she would find anyone else, anyone attractive in, the, in a sexual way anyway. I don't think she connects to sex in the way that she says that she does. So it's actually not that important to her. It's just that she just needs an orgasm before she goes to sleep, like most women. So don't even, you know, that's just the normal beh part of behavior, but she doesn't know it's normal because she doesn't know what normal is for most people. So she, she's just like, oh, well, I need that to go to sleep. And she's told herself that she needs that, but it's only a commodity. It's just like having a drink of hot milk to her. There's no, nothing else involved in it. And so she is only saying those things to Joe to get him to feel as shit as what she feels about herself. So actually, whether he does actually go on a diet or whether he does actually lose the weight um, and changes into this person that she's pretending she wants, um, I don't think it would make a slightest bit of difference because even if he got down to a goal weight, I think she would still carry on or find something else to bully him about. So actually, I think she's quite pleased that he's big. I think she's quite pleased that he's got an eye patch because she likes to have the upper hand. I don't think in a million years that if he become this super fit, cool hot guy that she because then all that would do is elevate her panic elevate her issues inside and go oh god now i'm not good enough now i'm not slim enough now I'm, you know so she has to keep him at this level so i don't think it that's why she stayed with him because it actually it doesn't matter to her it's no. just a case of whether she he'll take her shit or not take her shit in a in a mental abuse situation so do you see Joe and Lorraine as a kind of normal relationship or do you think this is a very unusual relationship? Well, I hope it's unusual. Um, I certainly don't have, <laughs> I certainly don't have a relationship like that. Um, and it probably wouldn't last very long because I'm not that type of person. Um, I would like to think that it's unusual, but I suppose you're talking to a gay woman who I've been out since I was 18 years old, a year before Ellen DeGeneres, or give, or have you know. Right. Um, and so for most of my life, I've been gay and, and been in female relationships. But um, I suppose from a, a heterosexual point of view, where it's a male-female dynamic, um, then it, it could quite easily be the norm, you know? Because like I said, there's offices all, all around the country with Lorraine's in them and they must be dating someone. And whether they look like Joe or not, or whether they've just picked very handsome men, I don't know. But... Um, you know, I think there's a lot of portraits in, a, in attics, in places. Mm -hmm. But yeah, no, I hope it's not normal. But I have a feeling that, you know, it does happen. And of course it happens. And what people don't talk about is the fact that this is uh, the female, dominant female that is almost bullying um, the male, which we don't get to hear or see about a lot um, in, in relationships, just generally, even like down to domestic violence. It, is very rarely spoken about, about how men feel in relationships uh, with, you know, these women that, that control them in that way, both emotionally, sexually, and, and physically. And I think it brings up some very good points 
about that. And I'm sure there may be people in relationships that will hear this um, that will think, God, that is a bit like our relationship. And hopefully when they do, they'll think, right, okay, something's got to change because nothing will change. If you are in a relationship, if you're listening and you're in a relationship like Joe and Lorraine, nothing will change you need to love yourself learn how to love yourself you need to learn what you love in life and what makes you tick and then go and follow that and don't settle for anything less than that because if you are in a relationship with either joe or lorraine um you're not going to be happy ever do you think people in this kind of relationship need some sort of help that's coming from outside of the relationship to get out um yeah i do i think it would take, but the problem is, is when you get um, something like Lorraine, for example. Right. Um, yes, because um, when you have a relationship like with Lorraine, where she's very controlling, what tends to happen is they stop you from talking to your friends, your family. They like to keep you very insular so that you, they cut you off from life, basically. Um, and it's really important for those friends of people who think that their friends are in a relationship like this to just keep checking in um, and that you need to keep asking them if they're okay, go round for coffee. You need somebody to keep an eye on that situation because that's how abuse happens is they just completely um, cut you off from, from all of your contacts. They check your phone, you know, these controlling types, this is what they do. You can't move or do anything without them seeing it, either your emails and your text messages and, you know, there's no way out. So mm -hmm. I think, yes, um, it is up to friends, family, people to get involved in that and say, are you happy? Are you okay with that? Do you know there's another option? Do you know there's a different way to communicate? And do you know what it is that you want out of life? And I think it's really important that outside forces come into a situ like, situation like this because it's so insular that, you know, it does have ramifications that could be dangerous. Like one could kill the other one or they could want to kill themselves. But it's definitely not going to be a good outcome. So mm -hmm. yes, there needs to be um, some sort of intervention from the outside forces. Okay, so if Joe was your friend, for instance, and he played you the fight in this play and said, this is what my girlfriend said to me last night. Yeah, I would take him to his house. I will go and pick up a bag, make him put some jammers and some pants and his toothbrush in it. And then I would probably write a really, really aggressive letter to Lorraine <laughs> saying how she was never going to see him again. And I would kidnap him to my house. And then I would ring a domestic violence line and get help for him. Interesting. So do you think what Lorraine does in this play should be illegal? That's a good question to ask me because <laughs> um, I, I, I'm not really a massive fan of the governments at the minute. So when you say illegal or legal, um, it irritates me. I don't think any. I don't think anyone. There shouldn't be Ill illegals unless it, we're coming down to things like such as rape or physical violence. Um, then of course that should be um, illegal, but not just illegal in law, but it should be illegal morally and in, inside of you. Like you should. You should have a moral compass. We all have a moral compass. We don't need to look at the law because, trust me, there is hardly anyone in Parliament that has a moral compass. So how dare they tell me what that I, they think I should be doing in life? But I think everybody has a moral compass and we should follow that. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, you know it's not okay to put your hands on someone and hurt somebody. You right. know it's not okay to um, make somebody so upset from something that you've said because without them instigating that now I'm not saying don't defend yourself if somebody comes at you and they say something really unkind to you and you and you want to go back at them and go back at them fine that's that's a action and reaction but if somebody just comes home from work and is like oh god you look like shit you know that's not okay that's not okay to bring your energies and then project that onto somebody else but I think it's more a moral compass than a legal illegal type thing unless it's kind of you know physical um, so would you say she should be prosecuted for the violence that she did when she was drunk, but not for what she does in the play? I mean, did she get arrested? No. Mm. Well, look, I've lived most of my life around people that drink heavily. And trust me, they do things that are out of character. They do things that are abusive, that 
you know, they might throw something at you. They might do something like that. And then the next day, not remember absolutely anything about it. Does that make it okay? Does that make that, you know, do you then a week later ring the police and go, well, by the way, somebody threw a glass at me last week when they were drunk in a pub. Does that action need consequence? Yes. But does it, does the consequence need to happen immediately? It kind of does when, when you're dealing with alcoholism because alcoholism is a disease in itself. And so, you know, it's almost like saying, well, somebody had um, schizophrenia and didn't have medication or they didn't have their tools and they went out and did something um, to somebody or something and then didn't remember it the next day, for example. What do we do with that? We don't arrest them, do we? We, we take them to the doctors. And so I think she needed to be treated along them lines like that. Interesting. So at the end of the uh, play, we get Janet coming back into the story and she did, she does kind of a long speech about how she thinks unconditional love is bad and conditional love is good. Do you agree with Janet? Do you know, it's a good question because we do have certain expectations in relationships. Like for example, you know, if I needed to go to the doctors, I would expect my partner to take me, for example. Whereas I shouldn't really expect that. But then that is a level of expectation that you do as a partnership. But if, if she, for example, was trying to tell me how to think or feel about a situation, then I wouldn't accept that at all. But then I wouldn't want her to then end our relationship because we had different views. Do you know what I mean? Um, so, I mean, look, there are, I think there's conditions to anything. There's conditions to being a parent, a brother, a mother, a wife. There's conditions to all of that. And that is about, not only caring for your own well-being, but the well-being of the other person or the other party. Mm -hmm. And that carries some conditions. Uh, and that is, you know, that you're not just going to make yourself dinner. You'll probably make dinner for everybody, right? So those type of, there are certain levels of conditions. But if somebody said to me, you always had to keep your hair short as a condition to love somebody, and I was in, totally in love with that person, I would absolutely tell them to fuck off. <laughs> because you don't get to tell somebody how to be in their life, how to look, how to, um, what to watch, what to listen to, how to be. I believe that a, rela a strong relationship is about walking the path together, holding hands and supporting each other, but not controlling what that looks like. So not codependence, where you constantly are, are dependent on another person. I think you should have a level of, of um, in, in, uh, what, independence. I think we should all be independent and have independent thoughts and independent things. But there's also times where we do have to come together and, you know, codependently do stuff like bringing up kids or uh, animals, you know, or, mm. you know, there's things where you do have, have a certain level of dependency on the partner. But I think it needs to be in a completely different context to what this is. Right. So on that note, what do you hope people get out of this play and your performance in it as Janet and Lorraine? Good question. Well, I hope it starts to make people think about what their views are based on um, a diagnosis as such. Like how much, how much we heavily put on that. So we, we make a judgment based on a professional opinion and then we completely change our judgment on somebody based on a mental health thing. Whereas actually that person is kind and considerate and um, does her best to make sure that people feel okay. But she has the stigma of this diagnosis. Then you have to grapple with, you, grapple with yourself over Joe because initially you think Joe's a complete twat and you just think, what are you playing at? you know, you've got a lovely woman in front of you who's kind, she's honest enough to tell you that she's had this diagnosis, seen him with Lorraine, and, feel, and then you start to feel uh, better about the situation suddenly because you think, well, he deserved that because of Janet. And then you think, well, no, hang on, am I now siding with abuse? Am I just because he did something wrong 30 years ago? Does it mean that he de deserves this now? And it's, I think it's going to raise questions in people when they hear it. They'll start going, have I held on to that for that lemma about that person? Do I need to have another conversation with that person? Um, have I looked at that in a different way? Or have I just judged that person on what they've said and not actually looked at the context behind it and why they've said it and, um, and not listened to the words per 
say, but listen to the emotion behind it because the emotion behind it is what drives this whole performance because um, it's not necessarily like what we were saying about Lorraine where she uses words to be damaging like weapons, like little, little tiny um, knives, you know, going into Joe's back and she knows what she's doing, but it, it's irrespective. The, the, the words are, it doesn't matter. It's how she's saying them, how she's delivering them how she makes him feel and people need to understand that we have to read between the lines with people and that just because someone's being either you know overly nice or overly vile that doesn't necessarily mean we know the person behind the words so I hope that it makes people question how they view other people how they when they meet strangers in the street I hope they're kind to them because they don't know what's going on behind closed doors um, I hope that it makes them question how they treat other human beings and that um, to always use empathy and to be kind in general. Okay. Well, that was Sarah DL. Thank you so much for having this conversation with me. And also thank you so much for being Janet and Lorraine and doing <laughs> an amazing job at both of those characters. I really enjoyed it. Thank you for asking me to do it. And I'll be happy to work with you again anytime. I highly recommend working with Greg, guys. He's a great director, brilliant writer. And I thoroughly enjoyed my time working on this. And I look forward to any projects that we do in the future. Oh, thank you so much, Sarah. Um, and on that note, uh, I agree with you. Everybody who hears this, be kind. Yes, be kind. You never know what's going to happen. And you never know what somebody has had to face. Mm hmm all right, so now that that's done, there's something I wanted to ask you privately. Yeah, um, I'm not doing bum love. No. 